Let's just pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity of being in your house. We thank you for the opportunity to worship you. We thank you for the freedom that we have here in this place to gather, to read, to pray, to sing, to break bread together, and to listen to your word. And I pray, Lord God, in these next few moments as we quieten our hearts and lives, as we gather around your word, I pray, Lord God, that you will help us. Help us to understand you more. Help us to hear your voice in our lives, I pray, in your precious name, Lord God. We pray for our family and our friends, the many who are away from us today, for various reasons, Lord God. I pray that you'll be with them, that you'll bless them, and that you'll give them more of your grace and your mercy and your peace. We ask in your precious name, Lord God. Amen. Good morning, all. So, I'm here to speak about pride. Um, the last time I was speaking, the topic was humility. So, I'm not sure how much of this is Paul's sense of humor, or how much of it is God actually trying to tell me something. And I suspect that it's probably a bit of both. Um, so, what I'm going to be sharing is probably as much for me as for anyone else here. This isn't a, I know the answers because I'm at the front. This is, I think, a topic that is interesting and that we probably are all touched by in some way or other. So I'll just pray. Lord God, I pray. I pray that you would give us ears to hear your word. I pray that you would open our eyes to things in our life that aren't as they should be. And that you'd soften our hearts to take on board what you want us to hear. So in Peter's first letter to the early church, he encourages his readers to clothe yourselves with humility towards one another. Because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. And now I'm going to apologize for my pronunciation. Et tu, dans vos rapports mutuels, revêtez-vous d'humilité, car Dieu résiste aux orgueilleux, mais il fait grâce aux humbles. Jivikeni, unyenyekevu, myanyeke ane kwa manga, mungu huapingo. When ye kiburi bali huwapa nema when ye nyekevu. So we'll see what this chapter in Corinthians says about how pride can be a barrier in our relationship with God and with others. Chapter 5. It is actually reported that there is a sexual immor- sorry, that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that does not even occur among pagans. A man has his father's wife. And you are proud. Shouldn't you rather have been filled with grief and have put out, this, out of this your fellowship the man who did this? Even though I am not physically present, I am with you in spirit. And I've already passed judgment on the one who did this, just as if I were present. When you are assembled in the name of our Lord Jesus, and I am with you in spirit, and the power of our Lord Jesus is present, hand this man over to Satan so that the sinful nature may be destroyed and his spirit saved on the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast, that you may be a new batch without yeast, as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival, not with the old yeast, the yeast of malice and wickedness, but with bread without yeast, the bread of sincerity and truth. I have written to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral, or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave this world. But now I am writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who calls himself a brother, but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater or a slanderer, a drunkard or a swindler. With such a man, do not even eat. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked man from among you. So the majority of this passage is really about the way that the church had essentially failed to deal with the behavior of one of its members. There was some sort of incestuous behavior that was so bad that even the pagans were appalled. And that's got to be quite significant because, you know, when, when Tristan introduced the book of Corinthians, he 
talked about the pervading culture in Corinth. It was a city of immorality. There were all these traditional Greco-Roman power institutions. And he didn't dwell on aspects of sexual immorality, and I'm not going to now. But it's important to understand that this passage was based in a city whose patron was Aphrodite, the Greek goddess of love. And worship of this goddess involved sex with the priestesses, who were essentially temple prostitutes. And of course, Corinth was a busy port as well, so there were lots of comings and goings and all of the stereotypes to do with this. Um, in British Regency times, a Corinthian was a name given to one of the wealthy young men who lived this sort of drunken, debauched existence. So the setting of this is a place where pretty well anything goes. And it seems as though anything was going in and amongst the church and its believers. And in this chapter, there are a few verses which we're going to focus on to do with their attitude towards people who are behaving in this, de in this way. Paul's criticizing them. He's saying that they're being arrogant. He's talking about their boasting. And I think in the same way that this was relating to their pervading culture, I think that our current culture means that sometimes we don't always recognize what we do as being full of pride, and sometimes we give it excuses. I think it's difficult to recognize ambition as a sin because it's kind of linked with aspiration, and that's seen as a positive thing. Aspiration that we can see um, a better future. We want to be the best that God has. We, you know, we want to be the best that we can be for God, and we want the best things that God has for us. We don't want to be living in a place of mediocrity. We want to use our gifts and talents. But that's kind of merged a little bit because I think society holds pride up as a virtue. It's said that it's, it's profitable. Reward, it's rewarded. It's an achievement. There's a sort of wisdom pervading our culture that you should improve yourself by whatever means you're able. You should maybe get ahead regardless of the price. You should make sure that you're okay. You need to take care of yourself. And I think when I say it this way, it seems pretty obvious to me that this is not what God has in mind for our behavior and our interactions. That idea of looking after yourself, striving to be as good as you can, even if that does mean trampling on people on the way through, is not modeling ourselves on Christ. Christ is the, the model of, of humility. He valued others above himself not looking to his own interests, but the interests of others, and made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Christ, Christ is the picture of true humility. He is who we should be modeling our behavior on. He is the one who, who humbled himself, who accepted a death that he didn't want to die because that was part of God's plan. And I think one of the ways that we demonstrate our pride is thinking that we know better than God. The, the earlier passages in this, um, in this book have already mentioned the foolishness of the cross, the idea that it is foolish that an item of torture should be seen as, as a way to freedom the idea that there is a God who chooses to overcome death by dying. A kingdom that's going to be brought about based on the weakest and the least influential. This is ridiculous in a society which talks about the importance of power and status and scholarship and worldly attributes. It wasn't just what was going on in, in Corinth. It's something that goes on throughout the story of the Bible. There are so many examples that we can look at at where man thinks they know better than God. Um, one that I was reading about recently was David. He's a good man. He's described in various bits of the Bible as the sweetest psalmist of Israel. He loved God. He led his people in godly ways. He's part of that big faith hall of fame that's discussed in Hebrews as being held up as being people of true faith. He was a man after God's own heart. But he thought he knew better than God when he was settled in his own house, 
and God had given him rest from his enemies, and he wanted to build God a house. So I'm just going to read a little passage from 2 Samuel chapter 7. So he's found, he's, he's made his own place, he wants to build God a house, and God had to tell him via Nathan the prophet not to. I have not dwelt in a house from the day I brought Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I have been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. Wherever I have moved with the Israelites, did I ever say to any of their rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, why have you not brought me? Sorry, why have you not built me a house of cedar? I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all your enemies from before you. I will provide a place for my people Israel and will plant them so they can have a home of their own. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom, and he is the one who will build a house of my name. Now, the Bible doesn't do the italics bit to emphasize who's doing what. But for me, this seems that God has got a very clear plan, and he knows how he wants things to happen, and he's in a position to have made them happen himself. So even in wanting to do something that was very good and very worthy for good, logical, right reasons, David thinks he knows best, and God has to correct him for it. The world does this so much. So many things, the way that it knows best. We are right, and we cling to our rights, and everyone else is wrong. And I think God is, well, I think we sometimes think that God is wrong too when he doesn't do what we want in the way we want. And that's something that I think I was talking about the last time I was speaking, and the fact that we seem to know better than than God in so many things. And it's what I do so much in my day-to-day life. I'm aware that I'm incredibly fortunate I've been blessed by God with a number of gifts and skills and access to opportunities. And I know that I am incredibly prone to doing things my own way, to sort out my own difficulties. Because in fairness, usually I can. I can do it on my own, and I can do it without having to ask for help, and I don't like asking for help. So I tend to only take a step back from things and pray about how to get through a situation and put it back in God's hands as a last resort. It's not a first resort. It isn't a, I'm in any situation, God, help me. God, how do you want me to handle this? It's more a case of, you know, I've exhausted everything, and now I might think about saying, oh, God, can you help me out a little bit? And even then, I'm pretty good at taking back control, even if I have successfully humbled myself enough to put all of my burdens at the foot of a cross and hand it over to God. I suspect I'm not alone. If I am and people want to give me advice, I will try to lose my pride and accept that advice from you all. <laughs> the Galatian church had started its life well, but it then had it started to return to reliance on the Jewish laws. In his letter to the Galatians, Paul wrote, Are you so foolish? After beginning with the Spirit, are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort? Formerly, When you did not know God, you were slaves. But how is it that now you know God, or rather are known by God, are you turning back to those weak and miserable principles? Et tu tellement dépourvu de sens. A quoi commencer par l'esprit, voulez-vous maintenant finir par la chair? Je n'y ni wajinga kiasi hiki. Baada ya kuanza na rohu wa mungu, Sasa nataka kuwa wakamilifu kwa uwezo wenu wenyewe. Paul had seen in the Galatian church how very quickly things could go wrong. How one small bit of wrong belief could pollute the whole thinking of the whole body of believers. So how one small bit of wrong belief could pollute the thinking of the whole body of believers. And he wanted to warn the Corinthian church in a fairly clear way that their condoning immoral behaviors in one of the believers was just unacceptable. He called them to this higher standard of living. And he used a very well-known image of yeast and leavened bread. So this would have been quite familiar, certainly amongst the Jewish traditions, but also around the early church. Leaven or yeast 
in Jewish literature was usually standing for evil influence. It's not always. Jesus used it as an analogy for the spread of the kingdom of heaven spreading through um, a whole batch of flour. But usually, there's something corrupting about it. When they baked, they used leaven, which was dough kept over from the previous baking. And in the keeping of it, it had fermented. Now, I'm not a baker. I have a fairly understanding, limited understanding of this sort of thing. But it sounds to me a little bit like sourdough culture, where you kind of have some gassy stuff that you mix in with a load of other flour to make the next load of bread. And I quite like sourdough bread. Um, but for Jews, they identified this fermentation with things going rotten. So hence the rotting, rotten and corrupting influence. And this is partly why, in preparation for the Passover, they search out every crumb of leavened bread from every corner of the house in accordance with the instructions they were taught in Deuteronomy chapter 16. Sacrifice as the Passover to the Lord your God, an animal from your flock or herd at the place the Lord will choose as a dwelling for his name. Do not eat it with bread made from yeast, but for seven days eat unleavened bread, the bread of affliction, because you left Egypt in haste, so that all the days of your life you may remember the time of your departure from Egypt. Let no yeast be found in your possession in all your land for seven days. So for them, unleavened bread was a sign of holiness. And Paul reminds them that their Christ, their Passover lamb, has already been sacrificed. And that's why Paul encourages them to clean out the old yeast so you may be a new batch. You really are unleavened. Just like Paul shared as he led communion, like Saul, in Christ, this is the old life has gone. There is a new life. There is a new way of doing things. You are free from your rottenness. You're a new creation. Christ has died for you. And in verse 8, it really emphasizes this. You are not filled with wickedness and malice, but instead you're made with sincerity and truth. This new creation thing, I, I don't know about you, but since I became a Christian, I've been utterly free from sin. Never a bad thought or word or action-ish. <laughs> no, absolutely not. We are new creations. We may have Christ living in us, our bodies may be temples of the Holy Spirit, but God gave us free will, and we live in a world of sin. And we have to take some responsibility to live out in real life what we are in theory. Paul tells them that the church is to be pure and holy. He's saying that in your arrogance, you're turning away from living how you should in Christ. And this was happening in the church in Corinth, and I suspect the same could be said for a lot of churches today. Jesus warned about the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. I'm just going to turn to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew writes about the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. When they went across the lake, the disciples forgot to take bread. Be careful, Jesus said to them. Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. They discussed this among themselves and said, it's because we didn't bring any bread. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked, you of little faith, why are you talking among yourselves about having no bread? Do you still not understand? Don't you remember the five loaves for the 5,000 and how many basketfuls you gathered? Or the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basketfuls you gathered? How is it that you don't understand I was not talking to you about bread? Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they understood he was not telling them to guard against the yeast used in bread, but against the teaching. And in the version in Luke, he goes further. Meanwhile, when a crowd of many thousands had gathered so they were trampling on one another, Jesus began to speak to his disciples, saying, Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What you have said in the dark will be held in the daylight. What you have whispered in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the roofs. Be on the guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. 
Gardez-vous du levain du pharisien, qui est l'hypocrisie. Jihad harini na chachu ya mafarisayo yani unafika wow. Jesus spoke a lot about hypocrisy, far more than he spoke about sex or hell, which obviously Christians get very het up about. He's very critical, usually of the Pharisees, but about all people in their displays of hypocrisy. He spoke about it in terms of their ostentatious prayer or giving or fasting, rather than secretly doing what needs to be done. He spoke about it in criticizing and judging others. He spoke about it in the superficial nature of their worship. They were honoring God with their lips when their hearts were far from him. He spoke about their attitudes which excluded others or made them suffer. He said to them, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. These people were too proud to listen to a man filled with the Holy Spirit, but dressed in camel hide, telling them to change what they were doing. And that is why Jesus told them, it's not the healthy who need the doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And I think this chapter in, in Corinthians implies a sense of pride too. They know better than others and of hypocrisy. That despite warnings from Paul in the past, because Paul mentions about this previous letter that he's written, which scholars think has probably been lost. But Paul mentions this previous letter. He'd warned them, but yet they still continued to associate with their immoral brother. It wasn't the immoral people of the world that Paul wanted them to avoid, because he said in that case you'd have to leave the world. He's talking about the fact that there were people who were in their church who was who were pretending that this behavior, which doesn't even occur among the pagans, was completely acceptable. So I suppose that leads us to the point of, what about us and our behavior and our choices amongst people who know that we're Christian? I think that we all have times of being arrogant and being hypocrites that we're sometimes a bit more like the Pharisees and the tax collector in the parable described by Luke. To some who are confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector, I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. Sorry. <laughs> For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and who humbles himself will be exalted. I think there are more times than we feel comfortable with when our attitude is one of, well, at least I'm not like that. I know I often use the phrase, do as I say, not as I do. But what does that mean? have to say about my behavior and attitudes. The Corinthian church were behaving that way. I don't know what they were teaching or being taught, but they were living as Christians, and they were behaving in ways which, whatever they were, went against Jewish teaching about being involved with your father's wife. And I suspect that there were a lot of outsiders who would comment on what they were doing. Flippantly, I might talk about my hypocrisy in terms of wanting my children to be independent-minded, but I still want them to get into their pyjamas when I tell them, no questions asked, rather than engage in a discussion about it. There are probably slightly more uncomfortable ones of what I say, not what I do. 
moments when maybe I need to model Christ-like attitudes to those who would never get to meet Christ in a church unless they saw something appealing in a Christian. Paul wrote, what business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? God will judge them. But unfortunately, not many non-Christians will ever get to hear that. It's hard enough to overcome some people's stereotypes of all Christians are judgmental hypocrites if I'm busy being judgmental of others or gossiping about them or displaying prejudice or hatred or being full of myself, puffed up. What if I spend my time talking about the love and generosity of God but don't sponsor somebody who comes up to me with a form for charity, a charity event? Or I talk about a God who protects the weak and vulnerable, but won't pay a bit extra for fairly traded goods. Or have a dismissive or snobbish or critical attitude against someone who makes different lifestyle choices to me in their intimate relationships. Or say that I'm correcting someone in love, whereas it's actually to put them on the spot and make them squirm or exclude them. If people spot this, this is as dangerous as a little yeast spreading through the entire batch. My lack of consideration in front of someone who knows I'm a Christian may undermine all the efforts to get them to join us here for a church service. Basically, if we're going to be Christ for others, we need to consider whether being boastful and arrogant is appealing. What about being caught out as a hypocrite? Because people do spot it pretty easily. St. Teresa of Avila wrote some wonderful words in the 16th century which still hold true. Christ has no body but yours. No hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks compassion on the world. Jesus feasted with the marginalized. He cha challenged corruption and hypocrisy and he restored broken lives. We are called to be Christ's ambassadors. We're called to faithfully administer God's grace in various forms and to serve others. We're called to be living sacrifices. If we cling to our rights and our status, if we continue being self-interested and justifying it, if we're proud and arrogant, I don't think that we can do this very well. So, Lord... I know I started with a bit of a joke about me ending up doing a talk about humility and pride. But I'm sorry for the times when I do battle with that. And I pray that we may take some time to look at our own lives and see where there are barriers that we put up to serving you as we should and serving others as we should. And I pray that people will be encouraged to be new creations, to take steps away from things which, which hold them back from serving you and serving others and make us more like Jesus. Amen. <laughs>